good morning or good afternoon, everybody. It's right at noon, so we can say good afternoon. Uh, like to thank everybody for uh, coming here this afternoon for this panel. Uh, my name is AJ Siegel. I'm a senior technical fellow at KBR, located at Pax River, Maryland. I'm also the former chairman of the BFS UAS Technical Committee. And uh, I've been doing that for a number of years, uh, but last year I passed the hem over to our vice chair, but I'm still supporting them as best as I can with all the bandwidth uh, available with other things going on. I'm also vice chair for the ASTM F38 committee. So we do a lot of good work uh, working with the industry, the regulators, uh, user community uh, in writing standards for UAS. So uh, it's a small community. I'm sure uh, you know we know quite a few people working in those areas. So I'm not sure how many of you uh, have heard of KBR. So I used to actually work for a company called Wiley Labs. We were acquired by KBR a few years back. KBR stands for Kellogg, Brown and Root, which is headquartered in Houston, Texas. It's actually, it's a multi-global company, uh, you know, it's presence in over 90 countries and it employs over 30,000 people. So it's a fairly good sized company. Uh, and we provide science, technology and engineering services to the government as well as the industry. So we work with the DOD, we work with the uh, commercial companies, uh, you know, we do a lot of research activity with NASA. So I'm personally located at Pax River, as I said, so my dealings are primarily with Navy, US Navy. Uh, I'm working on a number of projects for them, including uh, the US Marines MUX program, which is an MQ-9A Reaper uh, UAS. Uh, I'm also supporting their effort on MQ-9, MQ-8B and MQ-8C Fire Scout program, number of cargo UAS programs and uh, science and technology efforts. Uh, for the MQ-9 Reaper program, my most recent assignment has been uh, leading the effort for airspace integration. Uh, for the activity and and that's why this topic for this panel today is very close to my heart. So I'm really anxious to see the discussion and uh, getting into uh, areas uh, which should be interested to a lot of people. So this is uh, an event which is uh, hosted by Vertical Flight Society, and we have been doing this for seven years, believe it or not. In 2017, which was a mere experiment, Mike Hushberger and myself and Linda, uh, I mean, uh, 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 I'm going blank here, uh, Barbara, Barbara Lindor, three of us, you know, we sat down and uh, we said, hey, should we try to hold a panel like this at some other forum like AUVSI? So, well, you know, let's give it a try. And we got a pretty good response. And guess what? Since then, we have been doing it every year. We have been actually increasing the scope of the effort. We started off with a simple uh, topic of autonomy for tomorrow at that time back in Dallas, Texas, 2017. And that gradually turned into, hey, you know, the autonomy is becoming more and more uh, known to people. They are, it is getting close to being accepted. So as opposed to being for tomorrow, now it is for today. And now we are at a point that how we are going to employ it and deploy it in our aircraft, right? That's why we are talking about a topic like how do we integrate the UAS into airspace and flying or integrated with manned aircraft and other uh, uh, players uh, rather than being segregated into the airspace into smaller areas. So that's the focus of the um, panel today. As I said, the panel is hosted and sponsored by uh, Vertical Flight Society. Uh, Vertical Fl uh, Flight Society, as some of you may know, uh, was American Helicopter Society for a number of years, uh, formed back in 1943. Uh, and this is the only technical international society for science and technology and engineering type VTOL activities. It brings the, the industry, the academia, and governments together, uh, both in the VTOL as well as the eVTOL world. So 
I'm hoping that most of you are members of the of the organization. If not, then there is some literature there on the back table. Uh, please uh, take some, uh, familiarize yourself with the activities, what we do, and uh, we would love to have you as a part of the member. I mean, I personally, I've been a member of this for almost 45 years. I mean, I really love this organization. Uh, the networking, the amount of technical information we can gain uh, from you, uh, these activities. This year, we are fortunate that AIAA, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, is co-hosting this event with us. And Jim Sherman, thank you uh, for bringing that. And before I uh, go any further, I would like to recognize some people. Barbara, can you please stand up? Barbara Lindor from Sikorsky. Jim Sherman. Jim Sherman from AIAA, formerly VFS. Nick, Nick Lapis from Sikorsky. Graham Warwick, he's going to be our moderator today. So this is our core team. I mean, you know, we have been doing this for a number of years and, and we continue to grow stronger and I hope that we will continue to do that in the future. So today's topic is airspace integration. It's a very complex topic. It involves multiple different players trying to gain access to the same airspace. So the goal is that every one of these players should have an equal access to the airspace as long as the missions they are conducting are done safely. Right? So in other words, we don't want to get into a situation where if you are a UAS, you are a stepchild of the community, it's your responsibility to make sure that you are safe. I think it's everybody's responsibility acting in that airspace to ensure that everybody else, including themselves, are operating safely. So this is the goal as I see it. Of course, what makes it more challenging is that we have different size and different shapes and different types of aircraft. Their performance is different. Their missions are different. It may be delivering packages. It may be air taxi. It may be cargo uh, uh, type missions. Uh, all of them may have different application, different areas of operations, different class of airspace. So for example, if you're operating in uncontrolled airspace, class G airspace, it may have completely different requirements, different level of risk, as opposed to if you're operating in class B, C, D, E, and going all the way up to class A airspace, which are controlled airspace, different requirements, different challenges, different level of risk. So that's what makes it more challenging. And that's what I'm hoping that today's discussion is going to touch on a lot of these challenges, not only as to what it is today, what we believe it should be in the future. So we, all of these players I talked about will have an equitable access in a safe manner. Now, one of the areas uh, which we don't really talk about much is the DOD. For example, when we talk about airspace, we always talk about you know package delivery, cargo emissions, air taxi, but DOD, most of the people think that, hey, they're operating in restricted areas, warning areas, uh, international airspace, uh, blue water operations. What do they have to do with NAS? Well, they have to launch and recover from NAS, right? So they still have to pass through some of these airspaces. And personally, that's one of the challenges I'm facing as I'm working on these uh, uh, USMC MUX program I just talked about, where in Yuma, we are trying to get to um, class airspace A, but we still have to pass through, uh, you know, uh, airspaces like the B, airspace C, uh, D, and E. Of course, we try to get to the restricted area as soon as we can, and we can spiral all the way up to cl class A airspace, but getting to uh, that airspace itself involves a lot of challenges. So my desire today is to see that all those things are discussed, all the challenges are talked about, and hopefully, uh, the experts we have on the panel today will have some solutions, some ideas for us as to how we can tackle some of the challenges. So we have experts from uh, just about every cross section of the industry. We, you know, people from uh, NASA, the research activity, DOD, uh, Air Force, academia, um, Virginia Tech. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Joby Aviation, uh, Tom, and uh, user community, uh, uh, Choctaw Nation, uh, James. And uh, who did I miss? Uh, Standard Development Organization, uh, Terry. 
So one thing, being a part of an ASTM F38 organization, I can say that we are working very closely with other standard development organization like RTCA to make sure that we are not overlapping a lot of these activities, like some of the standards, for example, DO365 is covering a lot of the higher risk areas, getting into the, uh, you know, the controlled airspace. S similarly, ASTM F38 is working on detect and avoid systems, which are tackling maybe slightly lower risk areas, smaller aircraft, some of the operations at lower altitude. So we're just making sure that we are covering all these different areas. So. Um, we have to work harmoniously. We have to make sure that our approach is global. Uh, so there are a number of challenges and number of different uh, type of uh, approaches we have to take. So without any further ado, uh, uh, before I formally introduce our moderator for the day, Graham Warwick, who is uh, pretty well renowned in this uh, area. He has actually been a part of uh, every one of these panels we have run since 2017. Uh, he's a senior editor at Aviation Week, uh, and uh, before I hand over the control to him, Nick, I think you have a few slides you want to talk about uh, AIDA, AI, AIAA uh, uh, overview of that plan here. Just one second, let me get you over there. I'd like to spend just five or 10 minutes talking about a new initiative that AIAA is starting, a technical committee to talk about the uh, a white paper, producing a white paper by the end of the year, um, <clears throat> early next year, introducing it, to talk about some of the issues that we think want to be tackled for the long-term uh, solutions for AAM in the, in the, uh, the future NAS. Uh, and understand the certification of the air vehicles, certification of artificial intelligence, and also the development of a national network to allow air traffic management, uh, skies for all. Um, and recognizing the fact that the artifacts of today's system, I'll offer, for example, going from class A to class G airspace is a wonderful solution for today's problems and works very well. But the question is in 20 years or 30 years, is that the same solution that should exist? We have to recognize that, can I offer up, how many people do not have a landline in their house today? How many people do not use CDs to listen to music anymore? How many people do not have cable television connected to their house anymore? And these are rhetorical questions, but they point out the fact that technology brings with a change. And I'd like to go through that just a little bit and just spend a couple of minutes here on these, these slides. And I'm, I have a, a longer pitch that we're not gonna spend but the two task forces we have, one of them is to understand what are the issues with certification of the air vehicle and especially certification of artificial intelligence and autonomy of that air vehicle in civil airspace. And that's international questions. So we have a task force that's, that's asking those questions and helping to write a white paper. Anyone in this room who would like to help with us, you're more than welcome to contact me and we'll make you part of it. We're meeting once a month on Zoom meetings and we have uh, some dump files for people to put their thoughts into. And gradually we may actually end up with something cohesive if we're not careful. And the second question we have is, what does the future NAS look like? And I'll offer this up. I remember driving on a, on a parkway one time in Long Island that swerved dramatically because the road was put in after cemeteries were put in and they couldn't move the bodies. So the road was now swerving around. The cemeteries were later moved because the property is more valuable developed, but the road still swerves. So the question is, are we pouring cement for an ass and 30 years from now, we'll be paying the price because we didn't have the vision of what the future might look like. And I'm gonna offer some challenges to us. Uh, I'll offer one of the biggest ones. The FAA has a tremendous goal. I mean, integrating these systems today is very important. We can't disrupt the safest air traffic system in the world. I, I, I posted something on LinkedIn the other day that the United States entire population leaves the ground every 132 days. 
300 million passengers every one of 32 days. And yet think of the safety of those operations and the efficiency of those operations. It is tremendous. We can't disrupt that system. While we're introducing hundreds or perhaps thousands of UAVs to do work in metropolitan and rural areas, critical work. But in 30 years, it's my belief we can look back and say we had to do it because it changed the game dramatically. That we're not talking about flying. We're talking about raising the ground plane another few hundred feet so that things moved effortlessly and frictionlessly and without pilots and without paying people to do it. I want you to imagine what a UPS truck costs per mile with the driver. If it's not 15 bucks a mile, I'd be very surprised. How can that UPS truck deliver packages to people that live 15 miles apart? They don't get packages today. That's why James is sitting here as part of our staff. He is on our committee to talk about this. So what we're talking about doing is where do we go in the future? Uh, the National Academy of Engineering came up with a poor report. This is the, the cover of that report. You can find it by simply putting advancing air mobility, a national blueprint into Google. And the first hit is going to be the PDF file for that report. And that, that'll help a little bit talk about what this vision might be. It is disruptive to today's operations. We're not talking about 400 feet and below. We're not talking about pushing down, detect and avoid so every air vehicle has detect and avoid. We're talking a longer future, which may have other things to it and, and how that can be developed. Very simply put, what if we had in the future a module that every aircraft carried, kind of like your cell phone, that talked and had a network. So the location of the of that module was known, its ID was known, and its intentions are known. And those all together made a network. All flying vehicles had it. Now think about those beautiful Chinese displays of 3,000 drones making a duck at night, and a beautiful flying thing. No one ever hits each other. They're in perfect control of each other because they are moduled together. Can we do that around Chicago? Can we do that around New York? Is the technology exists to let us do something different than pushing down to detect and avoid? One of the things we want to avoid, I think, is asking a package delivery or a prescription drug delivery module to have on that drone the visionics to see all the traffic around it and avoid it. Imagine the cost to develop a visionic system and all of the necessary computation for it when instead you could have a network like your cell phone network that everyone knew where everyone else was and all the traffic was directed together. Now we're talking about this for a longer term, which means you set a vision and then we have some uh, a body that understands how to set avionic requirements, come up with the mops. Do we, we don't have anything like that, do we, Terry? That's right. And then, and then gradually work ourselves into it with the FAA as our guidance and our monitor to make sure that it's done smoothly and safely. And what that could look like then is an air traffic system where we all blend together. It is not 400 feet and below. There are reasons why UAVs want to be at 7,000 feet above cities. The reasons why UAVs want to be able to work underneath the approach path to Teterboro, because there are neighborhoods there in E-Package Express, but they can't be in that approach path where there's an airliner there. My goodness, they have to very carefully work the time variance of those systems. So instead of thinking about uh, partitions airspace, Currently partitioned, it's temporally partitioned in time so that whenever somebody of higher priority or higher safety was in that zone, no one else could be. And everyone knew where everyone else was. It was all self reported. These are, this is a vision of the future, which may not hold water, but let's give it a try and see what we come up with. And our committee is going to, to try and do that. I was asked to spend 10 minutes here and I've spent about seven. And I think that's enough because this panel is chomping at the bit to help you. Uh, know more about uh, what they're thinking. And Graham, you're you're the best guy to moderate this panel, so please. <laughs> and thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, um, AJ and Nick. Actually, be before I introduce myself, uh, Nick's comment about the road jinking around the uh, the the graveyard. If you've never seen the program James Burke's Connections, you'll probably find it on YouTube somewhere. There's a truly amazing episode in which he proves that the width of between the wheels on a Roman chariot set the size of the space shuttle. It is an extraordinary sequence of events, but it shows how unintended consequences of 
well, the way we do things. <laughs> so anyway, I'm Graham Warwick. I am uh, executive editor for technology at Aviation Week. I'm also your will work for pizza moderator for today. So, um, so I've been covering what we now call AAM for 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 quite a long time now, and and uh, and by AAM, I now mean everything from urban air mobility, regional air mobility, large scale drone operations like delivery and other and logistics, but also it's spreading out into other areas that use the same set of technologies, electrification, automation, that sort of thing. So, you know, uh, wildfire fighting and things like that. These are all, so I think the AAM terminology is probably gonna have to change at some point because we are, we are genuinely talking about advanced aviation of some sort or other, right? Not just mobility, but, um, and as I've been covering AAM, I've had these kind of like set of concerns as I go along. So my first concern is, is it technical fe technically feasible? Okay, yeah, it's technically feasible. Can they fund it? Okay, yeah, most of them, some of them can fund it. Can it ever be certified? Well, we're pretty far along the way to certifying some of these vehicles. Uh, can they get them into service? And the answer is because it's they're going to start off so mimicking existing operations, the answer is yes, we can. So my concern is focused in on how the heck do we scale? Because when you scale, there's kind of two sides to it. One is demand. Can you actually get people to use these things? And the second thing is, can we, you know, is there enough capacity, access, say to safely do that sort of thing? So I'm kind of zeroing in on this scaling piece of it. So I was sitting at the the uh, in the digital flight panel yesterday and and this is an obvious thing but it kind of set a light bulb in my head at some point one of the panelists compared digital flight with you know this this effort to create something so vfr is flight by visual reference ifr is flight by reference to instruments dfr if you want to call it is flight by reference to digital information which i thought was a really good way of helping me understand it and somebody said it's digital transformation, right? And then I suddenly thought, excuse my language, shit, he's right. Everything in our world is going through a digital transformation. If we do not touch the way that airspace and aviation works, not the what do we build, but the how, do, what do we fly, but how do we fly? We will have a digital world in which aviation is the only human limited activity left, analog human limited activity left. So, so that kind of helps me begin to sort of think, okay, I know what I need to start writing about. But then two things occurred to me. So I lived through the, the creation of next gen, the whole definition, the advocacy, the eventual launch of next gen of next gen i then lived through the backlash the disillusionment the failure to deliver the benefits so i lived through all of the mixed fleet issues the the uh, preferred access it, 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 the equipage issues and then later you put all this stuff in and i didn't get any benefit for it right so i was sitting there listening to this panel and thinking have we got all the right stakeholders in the room because if i remember rightly you know some of the problems with next gen were not in that room it was the recreational pilot it was the it was the it was the guy in the cowboy boots flying the 60 year old piper cub with one radio and didn't want the government telling him where to go and didn't want to to spend any money beyond the millions he spends keeping his engine running every day sort of idea and then there were a whole load of other ones right you know the pilots we're already we've just seen that the pilots have come out strongly against reduced crew operations. They're talking commercial aircraft, but you can bet they don't want anything to creep under the edge of the tent. So they'll be looking at UPS's caravan fleet, FedEx's caravan and ATR fleets, and they'll be saying, don't you dare let autonomy into these because ultimately it'll come. Right, so you've got all these communities going. Next gen eventually happened. 
or whatever the benefit of the exchange was, because we came to a single voice that went to Congress, sat in front of Congress, made the case for next gen, and something happened. So I was sitting yesterday thinking, have we got the right people in the room to get to that single voice, even if it's only a small single voice for a small initial step, you know, with some future idea. The second thing that occurred to me was that going back to AAM and type certification, and this is particularly true with the drone industry, People came into the drone industry and went to the FAA and said, tell me how to certify. The FAA says, that's not what we do. You come and tell us how you want to certify and we tell you if you can do it that way or not. You do the work and we go through it and approve it sort of idea. Very, very true. But that's what Airbus and Boeing did. They found us the people to do the work that they take to the FAA. Drone manufacturers didn't see it that way. Initially, the AAN manufacturers didn't see it that way. But you look at Joby, you look at Archer, you look at all that. They've hired hundreds of people spending millions of dollars to do the work to take to the FAA to get it certified. That's type certification. An individual company can do it. I was sitting yesterday, and I'm no expert at this, but I was thinking, this is airspace. One individual company can't do the work to get the FAA to certify a change to how we fly. We have got to get a community of interest, critical mass, and critical mass of, of voices and critical mass of money being spent to do the work. The guy yesterday said operational testing, operational testing, operational testing. We've got to do that. We've got to have a beyond for AEM. We've got to have a whatever for all these various things. Because if we don't do it, we'll go through the whole painful process of next gen. And it'll be 20 years before even the single first bullet point on any of, of uh, Nick's charts will will be ticked. Anyway, that, I'm not actually supposed to be saying anything today, but this is, this is one of the advantages of me coming to a show like this, because I don't cover drones per se very much, but it's really helped me understand the things I do write about, like Joby and other things, Agility Prime and other things like that. It's helped me understand what the next steps where the next challenges are going to be. So I will now introduce our audience who will actually talk about this. So, so I'm going to go, I shall just introduce them one by one, get them to speak up and then I'll introduce them. But basically we've got James Grimsley, Choctaw Nation, uh, Tom Prevo, Joby, um, Kurt Swearinger, NASA, L Atkins, Virginia Tech. I'm supposed to go go something at this point, but I don't know who they are. <laughs> Sterling Alley, uh, Athworks, Agility Prime, and uh, sorry, just so, I know your last name, I forgot your first name. Yeah, Terry McVen is RTCA. But we're going to start with uh, James at the end there. You can talk from your thing or, at the, or come up here. Do you want to talk from your seat? Fine by me, I'll just have to go and sit down over here. <laughs> I'm old enough to be lazy, so I'll talk to my CISO. Uh, my name is James Grimsley. I'm the Executive Director of Advanced Technology Initiatives with the Choctaw Nation. And I actually wear two hats, and I'll talk a little bit how those hats interact. Uh, I also serve simultaneously as an Oklahoma Transportation Commissioner. So I have oversight over state highways or bridges, uh, some limited rail, things like that. So I've spent my career in aviation. Um, and, you know, 30 something years, uh, Dr. Jacob in the back, he and I got our undergraduate aerospace engineering degrees at the same time. So we've been friends, uh, I won't say how long, but for a while. Um, but only recently have I gotten into the ground domain and it's been very enlightening in terms of how I think about aviation now. So if you go to the next slide, please. Oh, thank you. I'll do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. So the Choctaw Nation was actually the first tribe to be forcibly relocated back in the 1830s. The ancestral homeland of the Choctaw Nation is around Alabama, Mississippi, Mississippi in that area. Um, and the history is uh, kind of a little bit of a dark one in, in the way they were treated. They started having their area, their ancestral area sort of diminished and sort of, you know, cut back, cut back and cut back. And then they were finally forcibly relocated to what is now modern day Oklahoma. It was Indian territory at the time. 
So they were the first tribe to relocate. The, tra the Trail of Tears was somewhat of a tragic event. A lot of people died. They had to literally carry what they owned and take to this new kind of undeveloped land. So a lot of people perished along the way. Um, I grew up in the heart of the Choctaw Nation. Both sides of my family go back multiple generations. And if you're ever in that area, the culture in southeastern Oklahoma is the Choctaw culture. It had such a profound effect. There's kind of this warmness. If you ever visit, there's this way we treat people and everything. And that really is the way the Choctaw culture is. So um, I moved off. When I grew up, it was very impoverished. We had a lot of generational poverty. I was the first college graduate in my family. Uh, I actually moved off and paid for my own school, worked my way through back in a time and age when you could actually do that. But I moved off and never thought I would go back. I thought, you know, it, it's dying. There, there's no opportunity to go back. I'll never be able to work in aviation. So I worked in, in the defense community for 20 years in academia, did a lot of things. And about uh, 2016 or so, the tribe reached out to me. And, and these are people in leadership now in the tribe that I grew up with, have high regard for them, a lot of trust. We always got along really well. And um, so they said, we want to talk to you because we've acquired some property. We want to talk to you about it. And they'd bought this large tract of property. It's 44,600 acres. And when in the tribe can, they like to reacquire what was previous allotment land. They like to do that for, you know, for, for preserving the future. And um, they said, we have an idea on how to use this. We don't really want to mess it up. We don't want to do things that destroy the pristine nature. But could this be used for aviation? And being the engineer I am, I started giving them all the things why it was going to be difficult that wouldn't work. And they said, well, let's let's maybe look at how we can figure out how to make it work and they said would you be interested in consulting could we hire you as a consultant while i was at the university and come in and just tell us what what it could be used for what are the problems we're going to have so i did a series of reports about the regulatory hurdles uh, where the industry where i predicted it was going i got to the end of it and that's when the integration pilot program solicitation came out so they said this sounds similar to what we're thinking about. Would you write a proposal? So we did. We won. We were the only tribal government selected, had a very strong proposal, great team. And the interesting thing I found out about the tribe was they, they and I do this growing up, but they're very generational how they think. They don't think by quarters. They think by generations. And so they have the seven generation planning mentality. And I never really experienced that in my professional career, but it's very refreshing in how they do things. But if you go to the next slide, I'll start to talk about some of the issues we have. We are in a historic uh, generational poverty kind of ridden area. Uh, so a lot of the graduates that come out of there, the first generation, a lot of people in the leadership of the tribe, the first generation college graduates. But growing up there, my connection to the outside world were copper telephone lines. In fact, that was uh, one of the signatures of a first world nation back when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s. They had a whole lot of copper in the air and in the ground. And one of the things that I noticed over my la lifetime was that countries that did not have that massive infrastructure investment leapfrog when we started building out cell net networks. And it's remarkable to me to see in my adult lifetime that the gentleman sitting in the middle in remote West Africa has access to more knowledge, more information, more data than the most wealthy, most educated, most powerful person did on the planet when I was a kid growing up in southeastern Oklahoma. We've had a remarkable, remarkable uh, democratization event in terms of connectivity and access to information and knowledge. We have not had that happen. If you go to the next slide, please. We've not really had that happen in transportation. And in places like the Choctaw Nation that are primarily rural, most Tribal communities are rural, typically, and that's really the landmass of the United States. It's really rural, sparsely populated areas. But in modern day, 21st century United States, uh, your zip code is probably one of the biggest predictors of your life outcomes. It's a predictor of your health outcomes. It's a predictor of your access to health care, the quality of health care, access to information and not necessarily information, but educational opportunities. We are long over two for transportation disruption. We have areas in the Choctaw Nation that it takes an ambulance an hour to an hour and a half to get to you. That means for a lot of situations, you don't survive, you die. And it's sometimes rather simple, straightforward, life-saving things that we can deliver or get on scene that can save a life, a a AEDs, EpiPens, things like that. And so we're looking at this, we're, we're not so much into the hype. We see that this is gonna be a necessary step for the Choctaw Nation to overcome our infrastructure problems. In Oklahoma, 65% of our highway fatalities happen on rural highways. And if you start to look at what is the statistical value of a life in the United States and what happens in rural communities, a, a, a life right now under, under the US DOT's predictions and kind of statistics is worth $11.8 million, I would argue more, but it's $11.8 million in the United States we realize the cost to society from highway fatalities every year, $450 billion. 
In rural Oklahoma, it's 4.7 billion. We invest less than 2 billion in the state on our uh, infrastructure, transportation infrastructure. So if you start to think about the cost that society is realizing, and that's one of the things that's really struck me as a transportation commissioner, because I, I've been part of the aviation community where we've made it safer and safer and safer. And now we're to the point where we haven't had a, an air carrier accident in many years, uh, and it will continue to make it safer. We're going the opposite direction on the ground where our fatalities are going up. And as a commissioner, I started to see that. I started getting those calls at all hours of the night that says, commissioner, we've closed the highway. We had a multi-fatality accident. Unfortunately, there were three children involved or whatever. And I start to hear this repeatedly and start to understand the cost of society. We do not have the money on the horizon to build new highways. We can't expand linearly. We can't scale like we always have. We have to really take seriously the opportunities to move to the air because it's going to be important for the future. So real quick kind of synopsis of what we're doing. We're building a, a on this 44,000 acre property, we're actually building a test complex. We have what we call phase zero, about four or five acres we've already built. Um, we were building out uh, what we consider a modern test facility. We have ground-based radar. We built out all sorts of C2. So it's one of the most instrumented areas probably in the country right now outside of the military for doing testing. We're working with both military customers, both uh, uh, external commercial customers, but we're also demoing on what we want to do. We see ourselves as a massive user of things like drone delivery, AAM, and all sorts of things. I was always a critic of saying UAM because I said it's it should be ubiquitous air mobility, not uh, urban air mobility. We have a lot of use cases that are going to potentially transform society and the way of life in our communities. Fortunately, as fate would have it, the Choctaw Nation was located just on the very southeast corner of Oklahoma, which means that our border is North Texas. And so we went from one of the highest unemployment unemployment rates areas in the country to now we have uh, communities at the south end that have uh, unemployment of like two percent the texas growth is coming our way and so we're working with north texas because we believe we're part of that future ecosystem where we have uh, access to drone delivery so we've proposed a corridor we are working on with north texas we have some announcements coming out soon embargoed now but we consider this very real this is happening and we're 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 working to make it happen so if you go to the next slide please so that's my slide. This is a, a good picture that I like to, that, because years ago when we were doing uh, stuff at the university, we always had drone autopilots would fly away. The autopilots were horrible. And so I was over the policy and I said, I want a grad student with a deep sea fishing pole, heavy monofilament line, reel it in if it starts to fly away. So as we were taking a picture, one of the grad students with a pickup truck and a pasture, a cow photobombed us. I said, perfect. That's our picture from now on. So anyway, thank you and look forward to this panel. Mm -hmm. So James, I apologize. I did not read your bio before. Yes. Thank you for doing that for me. Yes. <laughs> I should have at least introduced you there. So I had a question. Um, what are your airspace needs? Is, is this fundamentally kind of like an on-demand uh, use case? Because you don't have a dense population. You don't have a, is it really going to be a bit like zip line in Rwanda type of thing where somebody does, Put just an app calls up and says, I need blood or I need a, a doctor or I need something. It's Is it going to be that very much a sort of dynamic on demand type of? I, I, th I think the answer to that, they have to describe how we operate as a government. So tribal governments do things that other forms of government don't do in terms of how we take care of our tribal members and our communities. And so there's a lot of things that we do where we more or less force our associates to get out on the roads on these dangerous highways to do things. And a lot of times they're very mundane. And what happens is we spend a lot of time on transportation and not on direct care. So uh, we'll have our community health representatives go to an elder's home, you know, elderly person, tribal member, and go to their home. And when they get there, they realize they're missing something. They're realizing a prescript, they, they've missed a prescription, they don't have a toiletry, they don't have something. And the way we're looking at it in the future, the most, the best use of that person's time is to sit there, work with the elder. And we're thinking, how do we fix those situations? How can we dispatch and deliver that? Put the QR code or whatever registration pattern on top of the tribal vehicle, give that community health representative some minimal training, we dispatch what they need. We have our own food distribution system. We have about 12 regional food distribution centers. That we, we're moving food around all the time. We have our own pharmacy network. So we have our own pharmacy network. We have our own hospital medical clinics that are spread all across the Choctaw Nation. So we're doing these things holistically that other forms of government won't do. And we're seeing very common needs across that. We honestly don't believe that there is enough money. We can't go back to Congress over and over for multi-trillion dollar bailouts for infrastructure. And when I look at the gaps we have in the safety of our road transportation networks, we will never solve that. And so we're, we're realizing that just like cell networks and wireless technology allowed regions that didn't have, you know, copper telephone lines, we had party lines when I grew up in rural Southeast Oklahoma. But when we've seen how we've leapfrogged, 
we're looking at how do we use this emerging technology to leapfrog from this problem we have. Transportation inequity is still one of the big inequities we have, because if you look at a major divide we have in society, it's rural versus urban. And so rural typically doesn't have access to the same quality of life as urban communities. And so that is because we have not had this major transportation disruption. We've never had a true democratization moment in aviation. We've never really had that. You could say maybe part 107 drones, we're kind of starting to get there, but we've never had that true democratization moment that really changes society. Um, I argue that even uh, air carriers, it, it was like saying that buses democratize society. Not quite, maybe in a, little, in a limited sense, but we haven't really feel uh, and experienced the full impact of what I think aviation could do. And I, I argue strongly, our national airspace system, we it's the safest, most complex in the world. To me, as an airspace engineer, it's still grossly underused. We can change how we manage, we can make it safer, but we can make it serve the needs of the public even, even more so. So I, I see it as inevitable. We, we don't have the money uh, in this country globally to solve the problem of the transportation deaths we're getting on the ground. $450 billion a year, that's the realized loss to society. That's a massive amount of money. And if you look at how much it costs to upgrade or build a highway per mile, and you look at how how the networks we need on the ground, you know, basically simple stuff, adding connectivity, uh, maybe some limited ground-based radar, but uh, ADSB, making sure we have coverage in the western half of the United States where we don't have a lot of towers. The cost is nearly what it would cost to upgrade our highways. And so I see it as as a logically, economically, uh, sort of a necessary step for all of society, but primarily those rural communities. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Tom Tom Prevo. Is, uh, he's the air taxi product lead at Joby Aviation, where his team is engineering the services and apps. I have to get used to that word. I'm a very old person. Uh, for Joby's eVTOL aerial ride sharing service in urban airspace. He was previously with Uber Elevate and before that with NASA Ames. So, Tom. Sorry about this, Jen. All right. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just my my second job is actually switching slides for James, and and I work for Pizza as well. Okay, yeah, um, happy to be here. I thought uh, I'd start out maybe uh, just introducing Joby real quick, uh, the company that I'm working for. Um, I'll start out with something that I want everybody to read and remember. Our our, our lawyers make me do this, so <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> okay, want to go back? Quiz at the end, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, who's Joby? Uh, Joby is a fully vertically integrated transportation company, um, and and we're developing, testing, and manufacturing an eVTOL, uh, all electric, piloted initially for passenger aircraft, so I'm kind of the odd man out here, uh, not talking about a drone, at least again initially. Um, and we, we don't just build the aircraft, we build the manufacturing uh, capability to, to build them at scale. Uh, we are already an airline, uh, we want to operate the aircraft and we want to operate it as part of a multimodal aerial ride sharing service, so that's kind of what we mean by fully integrated. And one of the things that I, I run into every day, almost everything at Joby is built at Joby. So it's it's a lot of things when whenever we, we get to a certain point, it's like, can we buy this somewhere? No, I think we're gonna have to build this. Um, so we, we plan to, to uh, launch our kind of app-based ride sharing service. Um, service once we've got the, the FAA certification. I'll talk a little bit about the timeline later. Uh, the company itself has about a little more than 1,400 employees. Most of them are in the San Francisco Bay Area, Santa Cruz, Marina, California, and, and San Carlos. And we have some offices in um, Washington, D.C., Germany, and Austria as well. So the aircraft, you can see a picture here. This is not, this is a real picture of the aircraft flying uh, in the marina area. Uh, kind of some of the key um, parameters here, as I said, uh, it's, it's designed for a pilot and for passengers. Um, zero operating emissions, fully battery electric, vertical takeoff and landing, and then transitioning to, to a wing, um, 
through kind of all nacelles are tilting. Um, about 150 miles maximum range initially, 200 miles per hour top speed, and, and it's been developed for over 10 years. So the company has actually been around for a while since, since about 2009 when they started in Joe Benz, our CEO's barn, essentially in the Santa Cruz mountains, uh, building rotors and, and testing like the key concepts to build really quiet aircraft. Um, as I said before, it's intended to be part of a multimodal aerial ride sharing service because people don't necessarily want to go from one birdie port to another birdie port. They, they want to go to from where they are right now or from their house to another place. So it's it's integrated uh, with ground transportation. Um, coming from Uber Elevate, where we did it on the other side, we still have a partnership with, with Uber, uh, but that's only one possible means for the first mile, last mile. It can be all, all kinds of other means of, of transportation that get you there. Um, oops, I think I skipped this. Uh, did I skip another one? No. Um, and uh, again, we're trying to build something that's seamless for each of our, our passengers that has very short transit times when we go from one mode of transportation to the other one. So, so that overall, the key, of course, is to save people time, right? If you need a certain amount of time to, to drive from A to B or take a bus from A to B or whatever, we, we want to do this, this faster or seamlessly, which also means that if you have multiple modes of transportation, you have to reduce those transit times. Otherwise, the basically the, the time savings just, just go away. Um, I put this up before. As far as the rough timeline, last year we, we received our Part 135 air carrier certificate. Uh, we're just operating kind of a small aircraft right now, but it does allow us to uh, get initial learnings on, on how to operate it, to build our tools around it and test them with, with real aircraft as we go through the further the certification. Um, as most of you know, the FAA is uh, in the middle of a um, SFAR, a special federal aviation rulemaking for uh, kind of our use case. We expect that to be kind of finalized towards the end of next year. And uh, we want to start commercial operations the year after. That's the rough rough timeline of where we are. And then I do want to show a little bit of a video. To date, we've flown over 22,000 miles uh, with our aircraft. And I want to show some um, kind of flight video so you get a better impression of what it looks like. Very dramatic music. By the way, we're flying at, a, at Marina Airport, OAR, which is a public airport and um, close to Monterey. And so everybody who wants to see it, we fly usually four times a day. And it's not secret, it's just out there. You can drive down to the airport and watch it. So you plan to start uh, with airport shuttle service, New York, um, LA, existing heliports to as close to the terminal as you can make it work out at the airport, um, existing kind of airspace procedures and that sort of thing. Uh, how, in your projections how long how long how soon do you start to need to see airspace changes to to realize what you want to do how quickly does it become where well, you need something more than that's there today well it's kind of the million dollar question right <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do think there is room in in what we have today to get started i mean one one of the key elements that how we think about it is um 
we know how to, I mean, there's UAM operations today, just like as you said, we, we've got helicopters that piloted helicopters that do these things today. Uh, air traffic knows how to handle them and how to deal with them. We know how to integrate them into the airspace. So for us, that seems like a good starting point to get our aircraft out there, show to the controllers and, and, and the rest of the users, we are, we're not that much different. We can kind of start operating this way. Um, and, and we will certainly, I mean, there's this, we believe there's certain things we can do uh, in working with the facilities and working through letters of agreement, other things where we can probably get some more scalability into the system and then optimize just some of the, the regular procedures. There will be a point I, I know where, where that might not be enough. And and we actually, I, I want to say we're pretty well aligned with what I say, with a, at least kind of the, the FAA's vision of how, how things are being progressing. You take some of these routes that are in, in higher demand than other ones and, and make constructs, maybe like corridors or, or around them to allow you to streamline the operations even more, to make fewer radio calls, maybe we maybe exchange digital information instead of uh, voice information to to get like the situation awareness in there and and so so you kind of introduce that one at a time and and we just there's there's different models also on how we can deploy the fleet we don't have to put uh hundreds of aircraft into a single phase right we can we can take 30 here take 30 there or something like that uh, so so that we we don't immediately run up into that scalability issue we do need to work on more scalable solutions, but I don't think that's immediately a barrier for us for for quite a while uh, to kind of utilize our aircraft in an air taxi service. I, I don't. I'm not going to give you a year for a number. <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask it right. It's a, a, a pet question. You've done two, 22,000 miles. I think all of them remotely piloted. Why are you starting commercial operations with a pilot when your aircraft is designed from day one to fly safely as a remotely piloted aircraft? It, it is. It is actually not. It is designed to be yeah, remotely piloted, but within essentially within line of sight or chase plane of the pilot. the The ground control station is basically an exact replica of the pilot controls inside the aircraft. It is not designed for at least as far as the flight management and things are concerned for, for autonomy. I mean, of course, it's a fully electric fly-by-wire aircraft, so that's, that's one of the pieces that's that's important there. But but it is literally being flown from the ground as if it were flown uh, from, from the flight deck. And again, the reason is we want to get this, our, our service out. We want to get operational experience. We want to, we can, we can offer this to people in a few years if we don't have to wait for new rules and regulations to exist. And and I don't see any way how you can do without rules and regulations remotely piloted in the airspace classes that we're interested in, which is primarily G, a lot of Bravo, a lot of Charlie. And again, as we said, we can't like equip everything with sense and avoid and have large ground crews operating these, those types of things. So we just wanna um, reduce any barrier to entry essentially, and then, work with everybody and the communities i mean obviously there's a huge economic benefit eventually if you can remove the pilot from from the you gain a passenger seat you gain uh, usable weight you you don't have to pay the pilots we have a pilot so a shortage out there so there's many reasons why it's it's desirable to get there eventually but but we don't want to take step two before we've taken step one if you ever get any of you get a chance to fly the simulator it's uh it's quite an extraordinary experience. I'm a complete and utter non-pilot and certainly a non-rotary wing pilot, but it is extraordinarily well uh, architected to make it as simple to fly as you can imagine. So uh, anyway, so our next speaker is, thank you, Tom. Our next speaker is Ella Atkins. Atkins, uh, Ella. Ella is the Fred D. Durham Professor and Head of the Kevin T. Crofton Aerospace and Ocean Engineering Department at Virginia Tech. She has pursued research into AI-enabled autonomy and control in crewed and uncrewed aviation. So, Ella. And I'm going to go here, so. Okay. I also need slides, um, but I guess I can get my own. I don't know. What do I do with the mics? Should I turn this one off? 
Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so I'm an academic, and so we're going to talk about things at a little bit of a fire hose pace. I apologize for that, but I want to get enough out there. If you're interested in anything you see, I have publications I'll be happy to share. This slide and the next one we're done in a project collaborative with NASA Langley. The idea with these pathways is to really just say, you have so many people that need to get from here to there. What do these pathways look like? So this first slide is the aircraft. NASA wanted us to have a whole bunch of pathways and the team that was working on it said, nope, really there are only two. But they're extremely diverse and worth putting on this same slide. The top one is how manned or crewed aviation sees the evolution. We go from today where we have planes that have people on board, maybe we reduce the number of crew members on board, but there's at least one who's certified as a traditional pilot. And then we get to the point where we put that person on the ground. And I'm very happy to have gone after the Joby speaker because that's exactly what we were talking about in that last presentation. And so how do we get there, right? There's a lot of, we have the people on board and we need to because the minimum viable product doesn't happen if we have the remote pilot because the plane can't fly in the airspace today. That necessarily drives that taut path to keep people on board for a long time. So now we have the bottom path, which is the UAS operations. I could have put a multi-copter, I could have put whatever, right? I chose to put something bigger. And the reason to do that is a lot of people are saying, you know, the UAS don't have enough sophistication. Well, that plane has some pretty good sophistication, so I put that there as the, as the model, right? But if, if you follow along that path, what you begin to see is that these planes are flying worldwide all the time today, right? Beyond visual line of sight, high altitude, low altitude, everything in between, and their reliability is actually pretty good, unless they're being shot at, right? But then the reliability is pretty low for anything. So if you follow that path, then you still get to civil, commercial, whatever operations that have the technology that you need. And we want that vision to connect at the end with what I'll also refer to as AAM. Well, uh, this is a smorgasbord of different pictures and I put them here on purpose. Again, top left, that's what we have today. If you're a UAS person, you gotta ask the question, why do we have the inverted wedding cake? And if I'm an academic, does anybody want to tell me why we have that for UAS? I, there's no reason. And if you look at the shape of those cylinders, there's a ton of airspace that is being reserved under the assumption that we're going to have human air traffic control with simple geometries and cued traffic because that's what the cognitive model of the brain suggests. But that is not what we need for advanced air mobility, especially in the dense traffic areas and low to the ground. So you take the maps of the sectors, of the airspace classes, of VFR, of IFR, and you look at them and you say, this is not modern aviation for the unmanned path. This is traditional aviation that's worked really well, but we have to acknowledge that and recognize that if we truly want integrated advanced air mobility, we can't keep those constructs on the upper left. So what replaces them? Computational algorithms, I'm an academic, and so I know this is not gonna happen for 15, 20 years, I get it, right? We don't just suddenly turn a switch and have all of those maps go away and everybody be retrained with data links and software that's certified. But what we do have is a need to do what all these other pictures suggest, to put the fixed wing, the rotary wing, the the all the different emerging aircraft of different sizes with different missions into the same space. The other thing that's really critical, if you look at any particular model of operations, you don't see all the traffic forever or integrated together. You see, for example, no offense to Joby, you see the Joby mission on the Joby chart, right? And if you look at DJI, you see the DJI mission on the DJI tar chart, and you see the zipline mission on the zipline chart. And there are so many companies, I'm in a university, no company, I wanna put them together. Right, I don't want to bias the airspace for one. And my first vision of looking at what didn't work was not like some grandiose vision. It was when I was at the University of Michigan and the survival flight almost hit a multi-copter. And they were both doing things incredibly legally. 
but they weren't talking to each other because nobody ever told them they had to. So this doesn't work. You can't just segregate things like that. All right, so now what do you do? As an academic, one of the things that we can offer is computational geometry. It turns out that we have all kinds of tools, many of them built for video games and fancy movies, that allow us with today's computers to do geometry 2D and 3D really fast. So what does that mean? It means that we actually know how right now to take every aircraft in the sky, wrap it with a safe volume, and have it fly to its destination or locally for its mission, and it's not that slow. Let me pause there. Well, <laughs> what do you get? Well, you get shapes that make sense for those aircraft, and that allows you to mix in the same airspace with geofenced volumes, any type of operation, any type of aircraft at any type of speed. You can wrap swarms if you have many aircraft together. You can wrap survival flights. You can wrap anything. This is not class A, at least not yet, but it's the other stuff. And one of the things that people don't talk a lot about is if you're flying a UAS or an advanced air mobility platform in an urban area, I just flew into LaGuardia the other day. One of the reasons you don't fly over Manhattan is that you can't fly under 400 feet without being in an urban canyon. You just can't do it. There's, the buildings are too tall. So that means that either you fly over the rivers, which are really congested if you consider everybody together, or you fly higher. So the geofencing can be used to avoid the buildings. It can be used to avoid other aircraft with local missions like that wind turbine inspection, and it can be used to wrap point-to-point -point corridors. If you do something with computational geometry, you're not limiting your solution to historic traffic, and you're not creating giant wedding cake shapes that will mostly not be occupied because you know how the aircraft are coming into the fixed wing runways. And you cannot build inverted wedding cake shapes for all of the vertiports that we're gonna take off from and land at because the airspace will be gone if we do that. So here's a couple other things. These will be really short. One of the things that I've done in my research career is look at urgent landing planning, which is, sounds a little better than emergency. The idea with that is that instead of crashing, you land. And kind of the new idea on this slide is that we have a lot more data than we used to have, whether it's video, LIDAR, radar, some combination. We can process it offline along with all of the other maps that are available and have a really super accurate 3D model of every building, every power line, everything that exists. And then we can use that online. So this is showing rooftop landing sites. I presented this to an ASTM group last summer, uh, actually 2022, and they were like, they didn't ask any questions. And when I was done, they were like, well, we hadn't thought of rooftops before. Now I've presented this and they've said, well, you better not be very large because you're gonna fall through the roof. You better get permission. So otherwise you can get a lawsuit for damaging the asphalt or disrupting the people that live on the top floor. And what about those rooftop parties? Well, these are all things to talk about, but if you're flying through Manhattan, that's what happens when you have an emergency. That was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so when you're flying through Manhattan, you're a lot safer landing on a rooftop than in Times Square, even though Times Square looks flat on a map. So a lot of us, you know, one of the things that we see in the uh, autonomous driving community, which is wonderful and allows us to make some progress with things like machine learning, is large data sets becoming publicly available. One of the things I always have to say in aviation is it would be super nice if we could get there. AUVSI might be able to help as could other industries and companies or and, and government agencies. So without that kind of data, we turn to things like AirSim, in this case with Unreal Engine, populate the rooftops as well as building the buildings, and then you can get your LiDAR and vision data to do larger scale simulations than you could with the data that is available, because the point clouds are still pretty sparse to do something like fly a low altitude drone through an emergency or urgent landing. So this is showing that whole process, and I'll keep going because I don't have a lot of time. 
So one of the other things that I want to point out is that when we're really practically talking about flying in low altitude airspace and we're not allowing everybody to get up above all of the buildings, we have a whole new ball game with respect to vertical obstacles. So if you look at the, th this work is actually being done by a helicopter army pilot who's a PhD student and he's pretty obsessed with this because his friends don't like the vertical obstacles any better than he does and the maps are just terribly inaccurate and they need to be better. So how do they get to be better? Well, we have to do research to find and map vertical towers, ideally within a couple of meters of accuracy. And once we do that, we don't have to discover them every time we fly. So this shows some of the things that he was doing in his processing of LIDAR data and the result, which is kind of cool, and it works for both the human display as well as the autonomy, is that there's this mesh or blanket that's descending upon all the point cloud to separate the higher altitude vertical structures from the lower altitude kind of uh, jitter that you don't care about. That helps you uh, build up only the vertical obstacles that you want to detect. So there's a lot to do. And let me say, I don't have a conclusion slide. I thought about that, but I already had so many academic slides that I didn't want to throw that at you. The reality is when I come to AUVSI's events, there's this assumption that the uncrewed aircraft systems are going to be able to fly where they want to fly. When I go to other events that are mostly talking about commercial aircraft that exist today, there's the assumption that the classes of airspace, the voice-based air traffic control, and the training of pilots will largely remain unchanged. These are not consistent visions. They're just not. And so if we talk about one sky for all, we have to acknowledge that the human pilot cannot see a multi-copter. So see and avoid is not a thing. That means that we have to have data link. That means that we have to do better than ADSB because ADSB will be overwhelmed when you have a large number of small aircraft within range of each other. And the only way to do that is to acknowledge change and to go after it in communities where you spend less time talking about how to enable precisely your soda straw vision of what you want in the airspace. And you start recognizing that everybody who wants to fly has the right to the national airspace system. And that requires that you don't just kind, kind of try to dismiss technologies that disturb legacy, and also that you don't assume that legacy is going to go away. It means that you have to talk about how to get there along these pathways in a way that works for everyone. And I guess I would throw out there that we have a ton of mathematical algorithmic solutions that will work. We just have to talk about them with respect and practical vision for the future so that we can actually make them happen. And like someone before me said, this is not for one company, it's not for one government agency, it's for everybody. So we have to look at it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Um, so looking at the upside down wedding cake, it, my first thought is it's kind of a, I mean, it's a cultural thing, you know, it's it's evolved, but it's also kind of a surrogate for trust. You know, that you you kind of say, here's a volume, and I'm kind of going to assume that there is, that, that something's happening inside that volume, it's supposed to be happening inside the volume. If you start drawing tubes in the sky, uh, particularly if they're dynamic tubes in the sky, even if they're not dynamic tubes in the sky, how do you get trust? How, what do you, and, and it presumably starts at your level with, the researcher level with with the rigor of which you approach the algorithms to sh ensure they're correct by design or provable or something because you have to start yeah. building that trust absolutely so so the computational geometry algorithms are provably correct mathematically they are certifiable this is not some voodoo of deep networks this is geometry you guys learned geometry in high school you just carry it forward and implement it efficiently and run all kinds of test cases on your code whatever you're doing to certify code in a cockpit you can do with computational geometry the trust piece is complicated because right now we have intentionally in over my entire professional career tended to say if the human doesn't understand each solution we don't want it, we don't trust it. The reality is when we use computational geometry, 
we can't have that kind of cued traffic understanding of what's happening in the airspace. But if we insist on having a model where only linear cues of traffic are going to be accepted into the airspace, then we will continue to only support runways and everybody else will be an add-on. And what that means is lost efficiency in terms of energy, and we do care about energy use in aviation, I'm pretty sure, and also bias toward particular type of operations that are either legacy or that get there first in this new world. And then nobody else will be welcome because those tubes are not dynamic. They're set, they're negotiated. Some company manages the national airspace system, <laughs> which sounds kind of funny. I don't really think that's the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to all be able to use it. The only way for that inspection vehicle, that life flight, that cargo delivery, and that air taxi vehicle to go through the same airspace for each of their missions is to dynamically draw those volumes and to make sure that they don't intersect in space and time. Academia knows how to do that, and we offer those solutions. Somebody has to pick them up and run with them. And I get that it's not gonna be gigantic profits. It has to be the community that says, overall, each of us are going to benefit because we have this dynamicism in our, in our solutions. Thank you. The, uh, it always amazes me that the the the, uh, the average IQ is supposed to be 100 and people with 100 IQ drive cars. And yes, we have a lot of accidents, but we also have enormous numbers of cars. And for some reason or other, there's a sort of like a paradigm of of road traffic that has kind of worked <laughs> over the years, uh, you know, and, and it's, I don't know, it just seems. Yeah, so I want to say something, you know, we can't change the roads easily. We were just talking about infrastructure, right? Wherever we put that asphalt or that cement, it's going to stay. We can easily redraw the airspace corridors. They're totally virtual. We have GPS. We no longer have these VORs, right? If you look at the IFR charts, a lot of the legacy from them comes from where the ground-based navigation aids were located. We don't need that anymore. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 please. How do we please airline pilots to make sure they're not going to say, no, we can't do that? Amazon Prime has 161 million members that spend an average of $1,500 each every year on revenue. If you multiply those two numbers, Amazon Prime's revenue alone, not DHL, not UPS, not all the other package delivery services, just Amazon Prime is three times the size of the United States airline industry. So when it comes time for Amazon Prime to pick up the phone and call Chuck Schumer and say, I want to land underneath Teterboro and all those airliners get in the way, they'll move the airliners. The economic world says we move where the money is. And I can offer up helicopters were making noise on the North Shore of Long Island. And in no time, they were no longer making noise because the people knew who to call. My suggestion is that, in fact, the answer will be when we all work the blended solution, as Ella is talking about, which means everyone is happy together, then it'll work. Maybe we uh, we need to expand our idea of what the shareholder, the stakeholder community is to include Amazon Prime members or something like that, you know, so <laughs> I think actually it goes to what James was saying about the community benefit that has to be a stakeholder in all of this, you know, and they don't, they haven't prior. I don't think that the, the actual community hasn't really had a say in a lot of this stuff, but going forward, it has to have a say in a lot of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you're right. So <laughs> our next speaker is Kurt with uh, NASA. Kurt is Deputy Program Manager for Technology from uh, for NASA's ATMX project, which is the next generation of air traffic management, covering all, uh, including the interface with space, I think. Um, uh, his, uh, his entire career, he's been focused on uh, researching concepts, technologies to improve the efficiency of uh, aviation and to integrate UAS into airspace. Kurt. Yeah, thank you. So give me just a second while I uh, find the next presentation. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about um, some of the visions that both uh, NASA and the FAA have been um, setting for how the airspace will evolve over the next um, 25 years. 
and um, some of the the kind of considerations that we need to make, you know, as we look at this evolution and um, how it should take place. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm Kurt Swearinga, I'm the um, deputy project manager for technology for NASA's ATMX uh, project. Um, we have a, a large, uh, significant chunk of uh, NASA's air traffic management uh, related research within our project, and it spans um, multiple domains from uh, small UAS, uh, large US operations, um, upper class E operations, and conventional aviation operations. And I always like to start these, um, you know, presentations just by by saying it's a really exciting time to be in aviation, right? There's, um, you can look throughout history and you can see various, you know, uh, transformations in, in transportation and in technology that have revolutionized society. And, and I really think that that we're on the verge of one in aviation, you know, something that's about as exciting as when we transition to the jet age. Um, and we see uh, many different um, use cases being proposed by industry, a lot of, uh, you know, venture capital money going into, um, trying to make these various use cases a reality. Um, and these include um, use cases such as small UAS for, for package delivery and various, you know, kind of public good use cases. It includes um, use cases like firefighting, search and rescue, um, and uh, large UAS applications for cargo transportation. Um, we have the Department of Defense applications that were, were discussed before. And then um, uh, high altitude um, aircraft for things like telecommunications. And um, I think that, you know, we're all kind of aware of, you know, some of the challenges that are faced by a lot of these new entrants. Um, you know, first is that in order to scale these operations, it's likely that um, uh, the current kind of air traffic management paradigm, you know, isn't sufficient, that we have to do something different, right? We, we also know that, that we have um, technology that's advanced. Um, we have the capability of, uh, of you know, providing digital communications and digital information. We have the capability of um, uh, putting automation on this aircraft um, for various functions. Um, so, so I think the the real, you know, big question is, you know, how, how does this all like integrate into the airspace? What are some of the, the items that we need to think about? And um, when I think about the future, you know, of air traffic management, I think of a few different dimensions. Um, these there certainly aren't the only ones, but um, they're the ones that I, I put on this slide. Uh, so the first is, you know, scalability, right? We see a lot of these new use cases and the potential for for higher density operations. I think Tom Prevo mentioned that for for Joby, like they think they can get initial operations going under the current, um, you know, regulations and paradigm. But that in order to scale those operations, they need something new, um, adaptable, right? Um, there was a lot of discussion about diverse operations in the same airspace. Aircraft with diverse performance characteristics, right? We can see this in the upper class E space where we have the potential for uh, traffic that ranges from balloons to supersonic aircraft. Um, safe, that goes without saying, right? That's a, a tenant of, of aviation. We need to uh, maintain, you know, safety. Um, resilience to uncertainty and degradation and disruptions, um, including, you know, various off nominal situations, weather, um, other elements like that. And then lastly, sustainable, right? We, we do want to uh, make sure that as we progress in aviation, that we are being, you know, friendly to our planet. Um, so both the um, NASA, well, both the FAA and NASA have put forth, you know, visions, um, complementary visions for the future of air traffic management. Um, and this slide kind of provides a really, you know, high level summary of those visions and what's contained within them. Um, under uh, so, so the FAA's vision is called Infocentric NAS. Um, it's kind of targeted around the, the 30, uh, sorry, 2035 um, timeframe. Um, NASA's vision is called Sky for All and is really targeted at the, the middle of the century from a timeframe perspective. Um, when developing Sky for All, we came up with um, four different you know, cornerstones, which are shown as the different colors here. The first one is focused on operations. The second one, which is green, focused on communications and infrastructure. And I apologize for that. I must have some automated slide transitions in here. The third on safety, and then the fourth on ecosystem performance. And when we looked at this, um, we, we we actually developed the kind of these cornerstones. Then we went back and looked at the infocentric NAS, and three of them were just like a really direct comparison with the three pillars of the, the infocentric NAS, which are operations, infrastructure, and safety. Um, so so when we kind of you know look at the, the progression of airspace in terms of these visions, we see that um, in infocentric NAS, the FAA put forth the vision of you know, full dynamic TBO, a vision of uh, leveraging additional div 
digital information for conventional operations to improve efficiency, leveraging you know machine learning to uh, improve you know predictions of the state of the NAS. And then they also unrolled their vision for extensible traffic management or XTM, which is kind of this overarching umbrella over UTM, urban air mobility traffic management, and ETM. Um, and their vision for um, XTM is that it would be primarily within this time frame, primarily done um, you know, within cooperative volumes, which are these volumes of airspace that um, essentially deconflict them from a lot of IFR operations um, and allow these um, new cooperative operations to, to be done uh, via a combination of, of digital technologies, aviation services, aircraft automation, and, and cooperative operating practices, which kind of define the interactions between those aircraft. As we kind of look you know, towards Sky for All, we have a vision of moving to a, toward a much more integrated system, right? We all want to get to the point where we can you know, have these new operations that interoperate with, um, uh, with you know, conventional aviation air, with airliners and, and things of that nature. Um, we also see you know kind of progression in like the digital information needed to support you know these concepts right where you know as we reach toward that sky for all vision it's likely that we're going to have to have data that's uh i'm going to call it much more trustworthy that's probably the wrong word to use but with the the appropriate assurance for functions you know like separation and then the third um one is um, integrated safety management. And for this, we did a lot of um, work with both our, our system-wide um, safety project at NASA and also with the Flight Safety Foundation who have spearheaded an effort to develop a, um, a roadmap for in-time uh, aviation safety system. And um, that's uh, been you know, integrated into kind of the ideas within Sky for All, and we're currently working with the Flight Safety Foundation to pull some of that um, pull that roadmap into our, our sky for all roadmap that's under development. And now we can actually transition to, to the next slide. I apologize for all the automated transitions. So when I look at kind of airspace integration, I see kind of a, a number of, you know, near term, you know, challenges that are faced by uh, various markets like the large UAS market, right? And I really think that for, for large UAS, you know, flying in airspace as IFR operations, a lot of the work is, you know, a lot of the the challenges are really focused on the contingencies. How do you manage things like loss C2 link, right? Um, how do you manage, uh, you know, the other functions that the pilot normally does? How do you get certifiable auto land? How do you um, integrate with traffic patterns at non-towered airports, right? If you have a concept like um, the U.S. cargo transportation that uh, reliable robotics and X-wing are spearheading. Um, so, so I think a lot of the the roadblocks are, you know, in the contingencies um, for leveraging kind of the the existing paradigm that we have, um, and in the need for for standards for the automated functions that are needed um, to deal with both those contingencies and routine operations. As we move into the future, I think that there's, you know, a couple of of considerations that we have to have. So the first is that um, we know that this future is going to highly leverage um, digital information, right? We need that digital information to be trusted. We need to have an understanding of its um, reliability and integrity through the entire information transfer pipeline, right? From the sensors it came from through all the communication networks that are used, you know, to the uh, algorithms that are using it. Um, so next, um, I have a scalable operational, you know, paradigm, right? We need an operational paradigm that's going to scale to these high volumes of operations. Um, third is built in uh, adaptability. And, and what I mean here is that we really need to think about, you know, how do we get diverse aircraft to interoperate? How do we put in these constructs that really allow us to not only focus on a specific domain, but focus on, you know, concepts that can be implemented across these various domains, across, you know, small UAS operations, um, urban air mobility, and ETM. Um, so so I, within NASA, one of the things I, I talk to our team about a lot is how do we look across these domains, look at how we can build in commonality, and then also look at where tailoring is needed, because they do have very different operational environments and also uh, different um, constraints. Um, so the third, I, I put the need for backwards compatibility, and I think we all have to recognize that, um, uh, that you know, the conventional um, air traffic management, oh, sorry, the conventional um, air transport operations, you know, aren't going away, right? They will evolve as technology evolves, right? As will other operations. 
but um, we, we need to make sure that this new paradigm is compatible with um, those you know, legacy aircraft that are going to be within this in the system for the next you know, 30 years. So with that, I'll let this transition to the last slide and uh, um, take some questions. <laughs> So, so thank you for that. I, 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 listening to um, when you mentioned adaptability, I was thinking that given the way the world is going, whatever we do, it we have to do. It has to be an app, right? So you you have to have like a baseline thing that's on your ATC smartphone, and you have to just tap the app when you want to <laughs> to be something else or be another user. I think the only way people will know how to do it. Um, I, the other thing that occurred to me was when I so when I when I left university and entered the industry and went into advanced design, the first big job I was given was um, was to do a drag growth survey on the last airplane that had gone from conceptual design to production. And they'd done weight growth, as we all do, and they built that margin into the design of all the aircraft, but they hadn't bothered to do drag growth before. As you put the antennas on and all that sort of stuff. So, so I'm wondering, as you're doing all this research, have you have you done like kind of like a backwards analysis of of the long what the longest poles are and when you need to start when you need to start doing something i.e if it's going to be mixed fleet equipage or so i don't know at what point do you need to start evangelizing to get that moving because some of these things will be on a shorter time frame than others and some may be on a decades long timeline if we don't get it moving now sort of thing so to, have you done anything like that yeah, yeah, we we certainly have, um, and we have a sense of what you know some of those tall poles are. When we look at kind of the um, FAA vision for for XTM, I think one of them is really developing these uh, cooperative operating practices. When the FAA talks about these, they're looking to industry to identify what these are and come to you know a common agreement through some mechanism that that has not been fully specified. Um, and so. There, there's a lot of you know work needed to to first of all you know make sure that we come up with the right set of cooperative operating practices right and then um secondly get consensus on those and then um thirdly figure out the fa will have to figure out how they're going to evaluate those and approve them and when i think about you know nasa's role in this i think about it as looking across these various you know xtm domains and asking the question you know can we create a layer in these you know cooperative operating practices that is common and then can we identify where the tailoring is needed and i think that's really important to do because if we don't look for that commonality now those different domains are going to diverge from each other and we're never going to get to the sky for all vision for an integrated airspace thank you Thank you. So our uh, next speaker is. Hey, excuse, can I, oh, can I yes, say no, please jump in? Yeah. For me, the tallest pole is data link. Like universal, everybody right. has a data link. And I just flew here on a Delta Airlines airplane that offered free T-Mobile. I could do anything I wanted, and so could a hundred plus other people on that airplane. Yet we're still saying that it's going to be cost prohibitive to have data link on every airplane that flies. I don't understand that. And it needs to to change yeah. because there's no excuse these days for not having ubiquitous data link on every aircraft. So I mean, I look I look at the, the lessons of CP, CPTLC and how long and how little it's being you know it, it's being used. And I also look at Leg 16, which is 40 years old and is now the widest used military data link because it was the most mature and the most easily, I presume the cheapest by then because we've been, been doing it for so long. But also, I think that the other thing is we haven't really, I personally don't think we've got our heads around the safety implications of ubiquitous connectivity. I, at the moment, we tend to think of siloed connectivity, i.e. I must have an aviation safety, blah, 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 quality of service. But if you've got 10 data, 10 forms of communication all doing the same thing, do you need that same calculation? I don't know. No, I mean, we've seen that redundancy diversity, resiliency, these are three of the big things, right? The and, and we have general aviation and other pilots today that smack iPads with Velcro on their control columns every day because it's so much cheaper and more versatile than paying for the big IFR stack in the middle. And they still trust their lives to that as they fly through the clouds, whether they should or not, they do. And here we are with satellites, with cell towers, with so many different options that are extremely diverse, extremely unlikely to all be hacked at the same time. 
And we're still claiming that we're decades away from ubiquitous data link. We're not. I have it right here. It buzzed at me a couple of times when this panel first started, and it is reliable. Yeah, and I, I just, I think we have to, you know, kind of come from both, you know, directions. So, so one is exactly that, and then the other one is that we we really need to develop a really clear understanding of um, the communication performance requirements for various functions that are being integrated, right? And if you do that, then you can start to look at these, um, the various communication mechanisms and the use of them together, integrated, right, redundant, and uh, figure out like what functions can you support with any given combination. Yeah. Okay, so our next speaker is Sterling Alley. Sterling has been with the US Air Force Air Force Innovation Unit and Agility Prime program for three years. He's currently head of the Prime Technology Transition Team, which must be a, is a critical piece of all of this. All that work has to go has to go somewhere, uh, and uh, he's working to create novel acquisition paths for non-traditional industry partners. So Sterling. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Of course, uh, I thank Barbara and Jim invite me to bring down the median age of the group here. So. <laughs> Uh, let's see, is that blue? So yeah, my name is Sterling Alley. I'm a mechanical engineering background. I joined the Air Force about four years ago as a civilian. Uh, I'm the tech transition team lead, which means I, my job is to understand the threats facing our nation, how the warfighters uh, are looking to uh, deter, compete, and hopefully we don't have to, but maybe defeat those those threats. And my job is to understand what industry is capable of doing and hopefully build the bridge to get that capability in the hands of the warfighter. So that's my full-time job, but I'm here actually today as a civilian deputy of Autonomy Prime, uh, which is one of the programs in the AFWorks portfolio. For those in the audience who are not familiar with AFWorks, essentially you can think of us as the innovation and non-traditional company uh, research arm of Air Force Research Lab. So we work with companies which might have never worked with the Department of Defense before, and our job is hopefully get them into the fight and get their technology in the hands of the warfighter, while hopefully accelerating their, their dual-use technology as well. So today we're here to talk about Autonomy Prime and uh, probably provide a bit of a different perspective on autonomy. A lot of our great speakers are talking about the future of airspace integration and really we at the air force see autonomy as critical to our defense but also the the competition for our nation on a global scale the most important message i have for you guys today is that we're not developing any of this in isolation we have near peer countries that are spending potentially more money than us more resources than us and working in a regulatory environment that is uh, easier to advance autonomy and what we think this unique ability of our nation is our talent, our workforce, and the reason AFWorks is here is because we have a new, unique way to access that workforce that maybe other folks in the DoD who are working in this space don't have. We might be able to pull in that two pizza box team that's developing the best computer vision algorithm in the world, and they don't even understand that they could be helping our nation while they do it. So uh, that is what AFWorks is here to do. So yeah, our process is to create create new transition pathways for those uh, non-traditional defense contractors to get on board. Uh, what that means is we're creating an autonomy prime proving ground, an open door, a purpose-built place for industry to partner with the Air Force, do iterative autonomy development, and hopefully field those capabilities, which we'll talk a bit more uh, in a second here. But what do we hope to achieve with this is reduce risk in four areas, talent risk, right? Internally to the Air Force, we have to establish the infrastructure, the expertise, the process, and the data management to go develop autonomy. But we also have to do that in partnership with industry. Hopefully, of course, there's there's still many challenges to get autonomous aircraft into operation. So the only way to do that is to go get to work. And th that means getting the right people in the right place to do that. Regulatory risk, a lot of folks here have been talking about airspace. Really, my my main concern for autonomy is, is regulation. And the only way to get to certification is to establish trust. And the only way you establish trust is to go out and do it repetitively until you know that it will work every time. Uh, and so. Many of you may be familiar with what the Air Force is doing with trying to build autonomous fighter jets, which is up here in the top right. Uh, but really, when we think about how do we get to autonomy, at the Air Force, at least and in our program, uh, we have a lot of test pilots. And so maybe this is a biased opinion, but we think autonomy development is autonomy testing. There's no way for us to go into a lab in isolation, develop an autonomous aircraft, and go out and put it on operation without ever flying it. And so to get there quicker, we need to be able to do more autonomy testing. And in the bottom left of this chart, you'll see where 
the vast, vast majority of atomic testing over the past multiple decades has existed. And we've learned a lot there with those small UASs, but from an Air Force perspective, those small aircraft are really limited in their operational value just because we fly large aircraft large distances with large payloads and those small UASs can't do that. The Air Force realizes this and we're trying to go build autonomous fighter jets like you see in the top right. And we need test platforms that can help us do that, like the Valkyrie and the Ghost Bat, which we're building. But these assets are extremely expensive and low availability. And so we won't be able to fly them as much as we need to to get the massive volumes of data that we need to be successful here. And that's the gap that Autonomy Prime is looking to fill. And so we're creating a, a test capability with Group 3 assets, a wide array of these prepared to go out and do testing. And hopefully these assets are of a meaningful scale to do meaningful mission, uh, but they're also available at, at the level that we need them to be. So what is, what is the Autonomy Prime Proof Gun? What are we actually building at Autonomy Prime? Uh, functionally, what we're going out and buying is a whole swath of different uh, Group 2, 3 UASs, as well as some manned platforms, maybe some of the Agility Prime style companies, bringing them to the proving ground. These, these are known aircraft, known quantities. We're not trying to test aircraft here. We're trying to test autonomy. So these, one, these aircraft will then be combined with uh, what we're calling an isolation compute layer. This is an open architecture server rack that we're installing on all of the test beds, a common architecture that allows software and hardware to be plugged in safely. And then there's a watchdog on the loop, so we know that it can't impact the flight critical functions of that aircraft. Then we are then going to write an MFR for those test beds with that open architecture on board. And we combine that with the execution infrastructure that we're putting in place down at Eglin Air Force Base. That's the people, the test engineers, the, the airspace, the hangar space, the processes, the data pipelines, all these things. And in the end, the idea is that hopefully the two pizza box team with their computer vision algorithm and their sensor can show up at Eglin Air Force Base for one day, plug that sensor into our open architecture, upload their, uh, their software on board, go fly. They can get that data that day. We can write a test report and learn a lot together. And we just keep iterating that process. Assuming that we are able to go build this incredible, exquisite uh, test facility for the Air Force, that tool is only as good as what we decide to build with it. And Project Free Flight is one of our first unclassified programs that we're trying to go build uh, with the Proving Ground. And really the objective here is to go build the first truly autonomous aircraft for the United States Air Force. Uh, I, I won't get into the debate about what true autonomy is. I think we all have an opinion here. But from, from my perspective and from the people who have to certify these aircraft, I think the, the easiest way to define it is the person who designed that aircraft and the person who's launching that aircraft on its mission knows what the objective is, is confident that it will achieve that objective, but can't describe exactly what may happen during that mission. If a threat pops up, is that aircraft going to turn left or right? We're not sure, but we know it will make the best decision that it can at that point. And so if we want to go build the first autonomous aircraft for the Air Force, how far away are we today? And I'll go quickly through this slide, but really the way I like to think about it is the life cycle of a human pilot versus an autonomous pilot or a robot pilot. Every pilot in the Air Force started off in primary school. They went through high school, college. Eventually they joined the Air Force. They went to basic pilot training uh, and they learned how to fly an airplane. At some point they went to their specific plane and they got type certified. Maybe they're a fighter, maybe they're a logistics guy. They go to their squadron and they learn tactics. How do we actually fight while we fly an airplane? Eventually they go to war games and compete against other pilots. And maybe one day at the end of their career, they go to weapons school and become experts in developing those tactics. When we think about a robot pilot today, you go back decades, we might have started with mechanical autopilots. We got to fly by wire, software autopilots. And then today, folks like Sikorsky and Barbara's team are building uh, what is an autonomous Blackhawk that I've gone and flown in today that I think even they would admit is maybe at the level of a basic pilot. We don't trust it to go do every mission, right? A weapons school pilot, we trust them to go do a strike mission in a contested environment against threats in any weather. We don't, we're not there with autonomy. That's where we need to get to with collaborative combat aircraft, right? our autonomous fighter that the Air Force needs. And the question becomes, how do we cross this gap effectively uh, of where we might notionally be today and where we want to be tomorrow? And the challenge is that to go from where we're at today to where we want to be, the data requirements grow exponentially. If you're trying to uh, see every one in a million scenario 10 times to train your algorithms, you have to go fly a million times to see that scenario once. And there's millions of those scenarios. And the challenge is we could go spend R&D dollars trying to fly the massive amount of hours we need to get there, or we can go put aircraft into operation today, realize value from them, and learn that that uh, that experience while we go. And so this graph just talks about if we were going to go put that basic pilot, that robot lieutenant into the Air, Air Force operations today, what mission do we trust them to go do? And this is not explicit, but it's a, a way of thinking about that. If you think about task, task complexity versus environmental complexity, each one of these stars represent a mission, and obviously the missions we all care about, fighting wars, so to speak, are in the top right of this, very complex, and we don't trust current aircraft to go do that. 
but there's missions in the bottom left with the, which we do trust. And each one of these contour lines is a level of trust for a system. And so we want to go start in something in the bottom left. And as trust grows, we can expand and do more missions. And luckily, the Air Force already has processes by which to do this. When we develop a new fighter jet, it, the very first time we fly it, we have very little trust in that platform. And so the military flight release, the authorization for us to go fly that aircraft is very restrictive. You're going to take off. You're going to leave your run, your landing gear down. You're going to circle back around. You're going to land. Uh, the question is, can we find a mission that is within that envelope of trust and go do it today so we can start learning? Uh, and then the final thing that I'll end on is, right, AFWorks is not the only shop in town inside the Air Force or the DOD working on autonomy by any stretch. But what is unique about AFWorks is our access to non-traditional industry. And when you think about how much money it will take to accomplish the challenge of filling autonomous aircraft, uh, and realize that the Air Force and the DoD has a very limited budget. Uh, we have to leverage industry who is spending billions of dollars on just flying an aircraft autonomously, flight planning, pre-flight, takeoff crews, all these things that are critical and the basis of any military mission. However, they're not worrying about the military specific things, right? The scary stuff, tactics, strategy, weapons control. What do I do when I start getting shot at? The only people who can spend money on that is the Air Force. And so what we need to do to get there quickly and efficiently is leverage that dual use piece and then use our dollars to focus on the scary stuff. So uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm uh, looking forward to questions. So, so where are you in standing up the proving ground and, and how do companies get involved? Yeah, for sure. So uh, spending a lot of time standing it up right now, a lot of contracts going out the door. Uh, essentially, we have multiple UASs on order. We have the server rack, the uh, isolation layer on contract that's being developed. So we're going to start testing those in combination uh, next month down at Eglin. And then we're looking to bring in our first companies and start doing first open door testing with with the folks out there by this fall. So is there an, uh, some, an, a do you publish an opportunity or something like you did with Agility Prime? Or? Yeah, exactly. A very similar format. Our RFI is out on the street now to collect information and then Around the fall timeline, we're going to put out another contract solicitation opportunity, and there'll be multiple challenges, a very focused thing, like perhaps we're interested in GPS denied navigation. There might be a prize for the one who can come for free test and win that prize. And we're also going to open the door if you have an amazing technology and you just want to come test, uh, you need access to airspace or a test bed. You apply to us, we evaluate it. If we think it's worthwhile amongst all the others who might want to come, we'll come let you fly for free and help you to get there. What about the timeline for, for, uh, for, uh, Pre-flight, what sort of timeline do you have in mind for that? Yeah, well, luckily as a program manager, I'm pretty good at risk management. So we got a lot of irons in the fire on project free flight, some classified programs, some cargo missions, some blood delivery type missions, as well as some ISR missions. So we've got a lot of paths going already on contract funding out the door, and we're looking to get the first autonomous aircraft. Maybe it's the basic version, the first iteration in service next spring. Oh, and, do, and and is there anything specifically from Agility Prime that you've learned that you that you're applying in Autonomy Prime? You know, so, something you said, okay, right, this works, or we didn't realize this was going to work so well that we said we're going to do it this way. Yeah, there's a lot of unique things I learned in Agility Prime, <laughs> good and bad. I think one of the main things we learned is how to really engage industry and be yeah. effective with them. Uh, the technology is different, but the pathway to to achieving results is the same. You got to form a partnerships that's mutually beneficial. And one of the key challenges with Agility Prime we found was regulation. And what's unique about the Air Force is we have a path to avoid that. And the Air Force today is facing threats that it can't solve without autonomy. And so all the way up to the highest levels of leadership, we're highly motivated to take those risks and put things into operation. So hopefully we can be the first use case for autonomous aircraft or the pathway. And then all the rest of you can hopefully drag that into commercial space as well. Thank you. So our final panelist is, oh, sorry about this. I keep losing my page, my place. Um, <laughs> it's Tarek McVin is, is president and CEO of, of aerospace standards developer, RTCA. He is a 30 year airline pilot veteran with more than 17,000 hours and currently chairs the FAA's research, engineering and development advisory committee on aircraft safety. So Tarek. Thank you. Um, I don't have any slides because I thought pictures of people sitting around a meeting room developing performance standards probably wouldn't be too exciting. But I thought I'd talk just a little bit about RTCA for those of you that aren't familiar. Um, as I was listening to the panelists, my blood pressure was rising, not, not because I disagreed with what they were saying, is that I was in violent agreement with what they were saying. And I've been watching some of these same conversations for many years. And in some cases, we haven't made much progress. But at RTCA, just to bring my blood pressure back down, um, 
we um, are an independent standards development organization. We've been around since 1935. Um, we serve as a forum for bringing industry and government together to uh, develop these minimum operational performance standards, um, uh, minimum aviation system performance standards uh, that are used as a basis for certification. Um, we have a whole library of standards that, that we've been uh, been producing since 1935. Some of them are still in use today. Um, and uh, those those standards are, are are referenced in um, roughly a hundred different um, federal aviation regulations, TSOs, advisory circulars. Uh, we've got about sixty of them are referenced by ICAO in their SARPs. So we're we're very actively involved with the uh, the aviation community. Now we've we've been um, tr more traditionally focused on traditional operations, uh, the legacy operations, if you will. But uh, in the last few years, as, as our membership has been evolving, uh, it, we're starting to bring in a lot more people from uh, urban air mobility, advanced air mobility, um, sort of uh, operations and developers. And so our membership is changing. And so consequently, we're changing uh, to meet the needs of our members to ensure that, that um, we're either doing one of two things, one either uh, developing some new standards that are going to serve that community, this the new entrant community, or modifying existing standards, which is another just as important th thing to be thinking about. Uh, we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel sometimes. We can take some of our existing standards and make some tweaks to them and, and, and get them applied to um, you know, what, what's needed by 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 the, the, the AAM community. So that's really been our focus. We, we tend to um, traditionally, I think, be very reactive to what are the needs of the community. Uh, we get either tasked by the FAA uh, or the industry to develop a new standard. But more and more, I think today we're 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 really trying to evolve into an organization that's that's being a lot more proactive, trying to trying to bring industry together, serve as a forum to uh, talk with the community like we're doing here this week, to um, really understand what is needed and uh, get the industry coalesced around some ideas that need to be be taken care of so that um, we can either approach it from a standards development perspective perhaps but maybe there's some other things that the industry needs that, that we can help serve as a, a catalyst to to get done so um so there's really kind of two parts you know to what we do yeah we develop standards but we're trying to pro also provide that industry leadership out there uh, to help again um, promote the industry, promote um, the development of new technology, but most importantly promote the implementation of that new technology. And it's that that implementation I think that we're really kind of talking about here. And uh, two anecdotes, um, as um, was mentioned, I was a former airline pilot in in 1992. Let's call it 1993. I was flying a 737, a 300 model, so the old version, and we had. Uh, um, I think it was uh, version 3.0 on the Honeywell flight management computer. I don't know what they're up to today, but it's probably in the three digits versions. But that that 3.0 version of the flight management com com computer could do things that, that are still not available for airplanes to do today in the current NAS. It had capabilities 30 years ago that are still not available to be used in the NAS today. That has to change. Another th another thing just happened to me when I was coming into Denver. I was coming in from Montreal on Friday um, afternoon, and um, you look at the how the arrivals into the airspace in Denver. They always have to bring you over one of four arrival gates: northwest, uh, northeast, southwest, southeast. Of course, we were coming in over the the, the northeast corridor uh, or um, entry point, and of course. It's springtime in the Rockies, and what do we have? A bit of big thunderstorm sitting right over that that arrival point. So we held for a while, and then we ended up diverting to North Platte. For those of you who aren't familiar with the geography around here, it's about 250 miles from Denver. Sat on the ground for a while, and then um, got the fuel, and then they sent us down to Kansas, almost across the entire state of Kansas to then bring us up into to enter the Denver airspace from the southeast entry point. Meanwhile, over the city of Denver, it's clear. There's not hardly a cloud in the sky. Now, where was the efficiency there? 
but that's the NAS that we're operating in today. It, it's got to change. If we really want to get some of these new technologies and these new types of operations into the NAS, we've got to do something different because even the legacy operations are suffering. I mean, where, where was the sustainability factor in all the holding that we did that day? And not only did we hold on the original entry, but when they sent us down to the south, we had, we did one turn and holding again. So it's just it was just an incredible uh, waste of fuel, certainly a credible waste of time. We got into Denver three hours late. Um, but you know th those are the things that we we that are, are really impacting the NAS today. And in order for us to really be thinking about that future integration, um, we've got to make some changes to make it really happen. Um, and so when it comes to integration, um, you know there's some great there's some great documents out there. Um, we saw uh, Acting Administrator Nolan this morning and showed the video of the the different corridors that they were talking about. And of course, from a standards development point, I'm looking at that going, how are you going to do that without some sort of standards that Joby and Archer and Reliable and WISC and all the people that are that are doing this, they've got to be they got to be operating on some sort of common standard, whether it's the data link standard or 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 whatever it might be. But they all have to be there has to be some commonality between all of them or all that back and forth in the corridors will never happen. And it certainly won't happen in any sort of free flight environment either. So we, we've got these great concepts. The concepts NASA has developed have been are great. The concepts that that uh, FA has developed with their uh, uh, data uh, inf infocentric NAS and the NASA Sky for All, et cetera. These are fabulous documents that are very foundational to what that what needs to be done in that vision for the future. But I don't want to. I would hate to sit here ten years from now and still be talking about those visionary documents. You know, the time has come to to put together some sort of national strategy, if you will, and and get the right people in the room, start working, and develop a true strategy now that actually has deliverables over a certain period of time to get this done, or else we're going to be sitting here ten years from now having these same conversations. Last last fall, the uh, the CEO of Reliable Robotics, uh, Robert Rose, came to me to talk about um, digital flight rules, digital flight operations, tailored flight rules, whatever you want to call it. And he asked if RTCA would kind of take a little bit of a lead there and and help promote that and and get it going. So we 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 put together a a group, um, a a forum on on digital flight. But one of the things I learned is putting that together was this wasn't a new concept. NASA has been working on it for 10 plus years. Uh, there's been talk inside of FAA for a while and uh, but it's been 10 plus years and here we are still talking about it. So um, I, I said said to the team at the time, you know, let's do some things that has a really good deliverable on a short term basis that we can get this done now let's at least get the concepts down and the and the a white paper put together that says here's what industry agrees to this is what these are the basic concepts that we have as an industry that we can then take to say the FAA and if they need want to develop some rulemaking based on that they can do that and and you heard billy say it this morning they want industry to come together and work out some of these things that we can that we as an industry can then take to them they can approve it and get it implemented because all roads do lead back to the FAA, whether we like it or not. Um, and you got, and it's not just one part of the FAA. There's multiple parts. Billy mentioned what five five parts of the FAA, and there's actually more than that in the sub level because uh, even inside of the AVS safety, there's a number of folks that you got to go through to get an approval. And, and Joby can probably um, vouch for for that. Um, so when somebody says, "Oh, we the People say to me, oh, the FAA, they've, um, they really like what we're doing. And my first question is, what part of the FAA? Because it it's goes beyond certification. Um, so anyway, these are some of the things I think about as a, as, a, as a standards person today and the importance of bringing some of these new concepts, these new ideas, and, and, and get, it, get it done and start moving forward and have these and have deliverables that you can actually point to and said, hey, we got this done and this done and this done, not just, a, not just as an individual company, 
but as an industry as a whole. These are the things that we came up with. These are the things that we got the regulator to go with. These are the things that the regulator can put into action, and we can actually make some progress going forward. So 10 years from now, we're not talking the same way we are today. So thank you. The questions <laughs> We are running towards the end here, but do we have any burning questions? I think we covered a lot on the way through, but. Daniel, do we see the need for some sort of an actual national plan as opposed to a whole group of separate folks each trying to do a very good job? Yes. That, that's kind of what I was referring to. That's, I overrode it. Well, that I, national plan has to include the communities and absolutely the, all the, the non-traditional users like the e-commerce and all this sort of thing. Absolutely. And that's what's missing. We got so many, we got all these different activities out there throughout the industry, and somehow we got to get those dots connected so that they're working in unison. The single voice is so powerful in the US. When we do get when the industry gets to a single voice, it really does achieve things. <laughs> A lot of us are engineers and scientists, but words are important. And unfortunately, a lot of times, instead of stepping back and asking the question, why, what is it? Uh, if you think of our, our regulatory system, it's a social contract. Now, when I sign a contract, it typically has a termination date or a renewal clause or something like that. Our safety regulatory systems in per perpetuity, you know, there are ways to change it, but it's from then on. But we make decisions like someone talked about earlier. Early decisions can be arbitrary because we we have to come to some consensus and move on. There's not always a good basis for that. And we never stood, you know, in 2012, we didn't sit back and have this presidential commission that said, you know, we have these flying robots. Are they always aircraft? Are they going to be aircraft sometimes? Maybe sometimes they're not really aircraft. And we didn't answer that question. Congress said they're all aircraft. So we inherited a century plus of rules that had evolved over that century. Most of them don't apply. So now we're having to weed out all these artifacts that don't really apply to this new technology. Same thing's happening on automobiles, on, on autonomous vehicles on the ground. We're saying they're an automobile. They have to follow the rules of, of the road. Why? We should be asking the question, why? These are systems that we can make behave differently. We can make them behave in ways that a human cannot. So why do we want to force fit them into a century old legacy regulatory system? We need to ask that question, why? Sometimes we need to pause and ask that question. We didn't do that in 2012, we should have. There should have been a National Academy study that said, this is a new era of something, is it aviation? Is it ground vehicles? What is it? And should we regulate it the same way we always have? So absolutely, I think we have to ask that so, question. So maybe we need to, aviation needs to renew its social license by proving yes. its public benefit, reproving its public benefit. And, and recognizing that the triad of aviation changed. In 1960, there was this very tight coupling between the military, between FAA and NASA. Agility Prime is a recognition that basically industry is ahead on electric propulsion and EV tall stuff like that. We have a missing piece now out of that triad that we always had that we relied on. Aviation would not be where it is today if we had not had the military. Look at always the first customers, the first ones who adopt the risk, even the Wright brothers. They, they wouldn't have gotten very far if the military hadn't taken an interest. Right now, we've fallen into a pattern where we certify aircraft and each new aircraft manufacturer is working hard to make sure that their aircraft can fly. This panel is about one sky for all. I don't even know how to approach the FAA to ask the question, what do we do with this inverted wedding cake, right? What would it take for an organization to form to actually begin to ask that fundamental question. We're applying Band-Aids right now with special use corridors. And the reason that those are okay is because they don't disrupt the inverted wedding cake and all of its friends that are on the maps that we see in current aviation and legacy aviation. So if this group can figure out, and maybe this is a National Academy study, how to re-architect the airspace to get one sky for all. That would be awesome because the only alternative is for us to keep trying to overuse the airspace that is below the top of the Manhattan buildings. And then to say, well, nothing else is going to change or we have one corridor here and there. And that is going to be both a killer for businesses 
and also a killer for the environment as we do the equivalent of flying over Kansas to get to Denver in all of our operations. And, and I'll just oh, add to that by saying that, you know, when, when we look at, you know, those types of concepts, I think there's opportunities to start looking at them and kind of low density, lower risk airspace, right? Remote areas and grow you think that? Sorry, I disagree. This is a panel. We get to disagree, right? Yeah, those those areas make the problem look easy because they don't force you to deal with the complexities as places like downtown Denver and Chicago and Atlanta and Manhattan because you can fly over the ground and there's not really anyone else there. So getting this vision of the complexity of operations that you would have at a place like Manhattan is really hard. Where's your survival flight? Where's your tourist? Where's your drone that's chasing a bad guy down a freeway, right? The list goes on and on and on. And so I really have great concerns that while we're doing these missions over low risk, unpopulated areas and feeling good about them, that is not the driver for changing the airspace because that airspace was class E or G already.